Yes, thank you. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to like to cover some of the financial assurance concerns and issues people had. Again, this seems to be a, a recurring concern, both both from stakeholders and over the legislature. I guess, first of all, we need to keep in mind what financial assurance is and what it is not. Financial assurance is not liability assurance. Insurance. Financial assurance is intended to provide a fund, a means for the department to carry out investigation, monitoring, closure, post-closure, treatment, remediation, corrective actions, reclamation, operation, and maintenance of a site under mine plan in the event that the permittee doesn't undertake those actions and fulfill their obligations. So it's a pot of money. It's a, it's a source of funds that the department and a third-party contractor that we choose can use to clean up and close out a site. That said, there has still been a lot of concern, uh, both in Maine and in other jurisdictions, that financial assurance amounts be sufficient to really cover all of the costs. Traditionally, uh, financial assurance has been assigned at values of $1,000 an acre, $100 of an acre, uh, not enough to close out a site in the event that a facility were to go bankrupt or otherwise fail to fulfill their obligations. So st uh, more recently, you see states and, and some of the Canadian jurisdictions trying to beef up their financial assurance requirements. Uh, three years ago, we had what I thought were some pretty stringent financial assurance requirements. Ultimately, the board provisionally adopted a rule that required uh, financial assurance be fully funded before we actually begin taking ore from the site. Uh, in response to, to some of the stakeholder concerns and concerns of the legislature, we modified the, pro the proposal a little bit. Uh, actually, it's rely I relied a lot on, on New Mexico. Uh, interestingly, some of the western states that have had the greatest problems with mine closure and reclamation have adopted some of the more comprehensive standards. Makes sense. And New Mexico and Montana, I believe, are uh, a couple of the states that are kind of at the forefront there. So taking into consideration all the comments and, and, and deliberations we've had in the past, what our, what our new, new proposal has is a requirement, first of all, that financial assurance be fully funded before a permit is issued. So there's a, a guarantee that the financial assurance is available and can be accessed from day one. It's not sequentially uh, deposited, it's there. So that's, a, I think, a, a certainly a step in, in the stringency end. Uh, at the same time, we heard during the public hearing and some of the public comments concerns that the financial assurance is not sufficient to cover all contingencies that in fact it should be worst case. Uh, I think, first of all, what is worst case scenario? I looked it up on the internet. You really can't find it. I mean, there is no official, there's not an engineering definition of worst case scenario. Typically, worst case would involve things like the largest possible disturbance at a site, the largest material volume, the longest haul distance if we're moving materials, the most structure, and things like special reclamation activities, such as water treatment, uh, control and treatment of hazardous materials, and soil amendments. So we're, we're using the highest bounds, if you will, for reasonably foreseeable or anticipatable, I guess that's a word, uh, activities or, or concerns. So we, we're trying to cover something that essentially is a worst case scenario short of uh, an earthquake, an asteroid hitting the site. So we're not looking at that. We already in chapter the chapter 200 proposal, and I believe it is in section 9H, uh, oh, excuse me, 9I, 
have a provision under the mine plan that the applicant must provide a detailed written cost estimate and rationale for each category of the mine plan, including at a minimum, and I'll quickly paraphrase this, the cost to investigate a release of contaminants at the site, monitor all aspects of the facility, close the facility in accordance with the closure plan, conduct treatment activities for a minimum of 100 years of all expected fluids generated at the facility, far past our active treatment uh, period, mind you. Uh, implement remedial activities for releases and maintenance of structures and waste units as if these units have released contaminants to the groundwater and or surface water. Correct, conduct corrective actions for potential environmental impacts from pathways from the mining areas to adjacent groundwater and surface water resources. And conduct activities at the mine site in accordance with the proposed mine plan. This also has the, some of the 33%, uh, excuse me, 15% con, uh, contingency, and she'll assume hiring a third party to complete all tasks. So we've got that language there. What I am uh, suggesting, that is a worst case scenario, mind you. We're looking at 100 years cost for treating all possible fluids and conduct uh, reclamation and restoration of all possible releases. Uh, I would, I would suggest that we could put that same language explicitly right in the financial search section. Uh, under, under section 17B1, we already require uh, the applicant to have financial assurance uh, sufficient to administer all activities under the mine plan. And I mean, one thing I'm, I'm putting to the board is perhaps we want to put that same language from section 9 right in the financial assurance requirements section. Let's make it clear uh, to anybody looking at this that this is, this is a, a reasonable worst case scenario. And we are covering all reasonably uh, foreseeable events. Yes, yes, I, w I will. We'll, we'll do so. Uh, Given that, I, I did distribute uh, a handout to you, and this is from a report issued by the World Bank, and it just details, if I can find it here, uh, some of the different types of uh, financial assurances, and I got it from Guidance Notes for the Implementation of the Financial Surety for Mine Closure. And it's in one of the one of the documents we, we consulted during our preparation of the rules. Uh, another good another good document on financial assurances is putting a price on pollution, and this is from the Center for Science and Public Participation. Something else we looked at, and uh, there's a number of documents out there to give you a little more background if you would decide to pursue that. Uh, that said, I think it's important to remember. The way that our financial assurance requirements are set up is, first of all, everything has to go into a trust fund. There's some advantages to this. With a trust fund, you have a trustee that is a third party looking at the financial assurances, administering the program in addition to the department. So we have another check and balance, if you will. We're also requiring for uh, facilities uh, generating Group A and B waste that they only use cash, negotiable bonds, or a letter of credit. We're not allowing surety bonds for these facilities. Surety bonds would be an acceptable form of financial assurance for those facilities only producing group sea wastes. Uh, it's important to remember or note, if you will, uh, over the last 10 years, surety bonds have become uh, less and less of a player in the hard rock mining industry. I think about 10, 12 years ago, it was very difficult to find any anyways. Part of the problem with a surety bond is it is analogous to a form of insurance where you have a bond, bonding agent and they are, are guaranteeing a site for a certain percentage. But inevitably, what you end up with is a negotiation to get that money an extended and perhaps protracted <clears throat> negotiation if it's a large piece, a large pot of money or pool of money, if you will. 
And for financial assurance, if the department's going to respond in a timely manner, we need to have access to that money now and when we need it, not a year or two later down the road. We also don't want to have to go through a protracted legal struggle to try to get access to the money. So by having cash, negotiable bonds, and a revocable letter of credit, we have inst essentially instantaneous access to that money. We can access that money when and if we need it. Now, I think the cash is, is fairly straightforward. Everyone knows what that is. Negotiable bonds, I think we've limited uh, uh, treasury bills, uh, municipal bonds of, of high rating. So those are pretty clear. I think there's a little bit of confusion over the way a letter of credit works. And, and essentially, essentially, a letter of credit is I'm going to use an analog analogy of uh, a, a line of credit <laughs> on your, uh, your, your home equity loan, if you will. So with, a, with an irrevocable letter of credit, a bank is providing the applicant a guarantee that that money will be available. And in fact, they are also providing the department a guarantee that the money will be available for the department's use. For that, what the bank is looking at is they're looking at the financial capacity and the ability to pay on that what is a loan to the bank. So they're reviewing an applicant's financial status and somebody with a, a high credit rating is going to get a l slightly lower rate than somebody with a lower credit rating. Again, just like you might for a home equity loan. And for that, the applicant is paying several percent per year, say, uh, for the to obtain that letter of credit. So you go to the bank, they review your financial capability or capacity to pay that loan back, and then they are offering you a letter of credit for which you are paying some percentage on an annual basis. Typically, a letter of credit is only issued for one year. In fact, we have been told that it is virtually impossible to get a letter of credit for more than one year. Uh, this is because the financial institutions want to review somebody's capacity on an annual basis. The proposed rule requires that if you use a letter of credit as your financial assurance, you need to renew this within 90 days, I believe it is, of the deadline or termination date. And if you do not do so, then it automatically becomes forfeited to the department. So a financial institution is going into this knowing that if if the uh, mining operation does not renew this, then they are legally obligated to loan them that money. But again, it's important. This is not like a surety company where it is the bonding company's money. This is a bank providing a loan to the applicant. Does that make sense? Well, If you do not if if you do not have financial assurance, you would need to cease operation. So and and a permitting yes and then 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 the state has the state has the financial assurance to complete uh, reclamation or, or whatever other activities are necessary on the site. Uh, typically, a letter of credit is is probably the most used and most secure form of financial assurance outside of negotiable bonds or cash. Uh, there are very few companies or applicants that probably want to put up tens of millions of dollars of cash, so they'll go the letter of credit route. And in fact, uh, our proposal, again, it's structured very similarly to what New Mexico has done as far as the terms and conditions of a letter of credit. Uh, 
in the event that uh, a mining company did not complete their obligations, how that letter of credit, that money is forfeited to the state of Maine, to the department, for our use to reclaim a site and remediate it. Uh, I've also incorporated some provisions for uh, the return of the financial assurance. In other words, when a mining site is finally closed and everything has been reclaimed, how does a, how does a, a mining company get back their financial assurance? And we, rather than just simply submitting a letter to the department, uh, our proposal incorporates a, a fairly extensive public review process, public uh, participation process. So the public's involved with this at every step of the way. The public's involved with the financial assurance determination when an application comes in the door because of the public participation uh, procedures in the, during the initial application. And the public has an opportunity to participate when, in fact, that financial assurance is returned to the mining company. And we think this is important, again, just to make sure everybody is confident that things are being done according to the permit, according to the rule, and according to the Mining Act. Oh, yeah, please, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, let's assume that it's uh, 2008. We're in New York City, just checking out to see how the uh, permittee applicant uh, letter of credit with Lehman Bank is going. And um, a day later, Lehman Bank is gone. Gone. Not a penny to be had. And the uh, applicant does have, has nowhere near the amount of money required to cover that letter of credit. Letters of credit are way weaker than it shows on this chart particularly the bottom last line, uh, thereby minimizing the risk of failure of weak banks. I'd like to know what a weak bank is. And, and as an example, one of the top banks in the country, Lehman Brothers, was not a weak bank. bank. But one day, bang, and just very quickly, one of my students was a senior vice president at Lehman Bank, and his boss, came to him and said, we're going to have to let you go. Things are going downhill fast. And so my student said, well, with regard to my severance, he said, no problem. I'm going to give you a, an office and a secretary to get so you can get a job and so on. Or I'll pay, pay you severance over a period of time, a couple hundred thousand dollars. He goes over and gets a secretary and gets an office just across the street. And then he thinks, oh my god, what am I doing? So he called up his boss again and said, hey, can I get the entire thing right now? Sure, come on over. You know, we got a bank for a couple hundred, we got a check for a couple hundred thousand, and uh, put it somewhere else. And uh, the next day is when Lehman actually did go. And he didn't know it was going to be a day later, but one day makes a very big difference. So I keep hearing about surety bonds. I'm looking at the surety bonds, the way they get it tied up here. But um, you've got to buy, you've got to find somebody who will will bond you. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, is that, uh, uh, what you might call it, uh, over uh, Lloyd's of London? Or, I mean, what are we talking about? Multi-million dollar coverage to close up the facility. It's, it's important to keep in mind that under the proposal, surety bonds could only be used for a facility that's just producing Group C waste. Mm -hmm. So it would be waste that do not have uh, acid potential. So. It's, it's basically intended to cover a, a facility that is posing less of a, an environmental threat, if you will, and, and hopefully would be a lot easier to remediate or clean up after the fact. Uh, there are a number of, of surety providers. I, I don't know any of them off the top of my head, but their surety bonds are typically used in coal mining industry and still used an awful lot in, in the mining industry out west. Our concern is simply that they are not as secure as other methods or other, other forms of financial assurance uh, in assuring that the state of Maine and the people in the state are not going to be left holding a cleanup ticket. So that's the, that's the thing. We want to make sure that the people of Maine ultimately do not have to bear any cost in the event of a problem of cleaning up a site. So how, how much 
Where well, does the money come from? Yeah, the, the, the best solution is through the use of, again, a, a trust fund with a third party trustee overseeing that, that is financed either through cash, negotiable bonds, or an irrevocable letter of credit. So that's what we're, that's what we are proposing for Group A and B wastes. of those one of those three to yes. fund the trust yes. fund so I guess my, my first question is do, how many of those mines out west when they had a problem had surety bonds that failed I can't answer that on top of my off, off, off the top of my head okay. uh, just one more thing on this it turns out that the feedback is significant there we go the town of Farmington is preparing on the planning board, preparing for next month, hearing a local farmer who has 700 acres, who has been uh, approached by a large solar panel, solar company to, move, to build an 80 megawatt solar farm uh, on his property. And uh, chances are he would be getting about $300,000 a year for rental or lease or whatever it would be. And he's got to come to the planning board, which I'm a member, to um, ask us about that. So I had a meeting with uh, with one of the family, because it's a large family involved. And I said, well, there's a risk issue here. The risk issue is bifold. It's a risk to you as a family that Solyndra, or any, in fact, there's a big Spanish one right now that within the last year, the, one of the largest solar uh, companies in the world, that have basically walked away. And it's over and over and over again. I've got a list of 114, 128 companies worldwide since 2013 that have cashed in by bankruptcy and left. They get the monies, they get all the enticements and everything else, and then they walk away, leaving everything. So uh, the farmer and uh, his family are thinking, you know, this is, maybe the planning board shouldn't let us do this. Meanwhile, the planning board would, I assume, we haven't met yet, probably wouldn't want to get involved in with this unless they had some type of an assurance, yeah. and it may or may not be an assurity bond, uh, an assurance that the uh, cost, which would be in the millions, to shut this place down if they just finished building it and then walked away, or well, the same river flooded as it does often, and took out a whole portion of that stuff. And so there's a twofold risk. The town has a risk. The family has a risk. I don't know what's going to happen with this one, but I, I have my ideas about it. But uh, it's it's something where what you tell me sounds good. It, it says cash deposit, and you read down through here, it looks good. But as as I'm thinking, there's no way in the world that this farmer is going to be able to get a short bond from uh, anyone who's doing those uh, things, they're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars at maximum. They're not looking at millions of them. And that's cash basically that's then put in some type of a, um, probably a trust fund. So that money is there, theoretically, and they'll be able to use it should things go wrong. We're in the same case now, it sounds good, and uh, the, comp the, the mining companies, whomever they might be, certainly used to this stuff. So I don't see any problem with the cash one you're talking about at this point. The point is, we're protected cash up front. They have to figure out who's going to bond them to be able to give cash up front. And then that'll determine whether or not a mining company is going to want to take that risk themselves, but if they're a mining company, they probably already have. Hmm. Well, I think that's a good point. Uh, you know, any, any company that's going to apply for a mining permit is going to be looking into this. And it's part of their, you know, 
internal review whether they have the money and, and have access to the funds to do this. All enters into part of the same as almost financial capacity. Do we have the money to undertake this project? And if we don't, then it can't be undertaken. those two as examples of very clearly the most secure and uh, readily available sources of funding, if you will. Uh, so if, if the board wanted to, you could, you could introduce a requirement that, you know, at least 10 percent, pick a number, you know, the financial assurance be funded with, with cash or negotiable bonds. I mean, if somebody wanted to take things a step further. Bankers, what about the bankers, what about the insurance companies? We should provide the kinds of surety we will accept. We have no idea what kind of assets a company may have. They may have a tremendous number of assets which aren't bound up a committee. They may be able to get that easily. They may not be able to get that. If they don't get it, they don't get the permit. But for us to come up, well, we want you to put up this much cash, this percentage of cash. We're now making decisions based on something we have no information to work with. No, I, I think what we have to look at is perhaps, as, as uh, Mary was saying, a combination of one or two or three of these that they can utilize to their benefit. Not requiring all ball, not requiring all cash, but let them come in with the mix that their financial backers can provide and then make the determination whether it's acceptable. And this fund's going to be man uh, managed by some quote, independent trustee, which I have a whole lot of reservation about. That's not a whole game. Uh, then that individual should be involved in helping determine whether those are acceptable or non-acceptable funds. The other thing that we have to be careful of is you, if you have an independent trustee, the trustee may decide whether mine or not the department because the independent trustee will make the determination as to where that money is spent. Therefore, that's one of the reservations I have about both this independent trustee, because if that trustee is not under the direction of the department, which then sort of negates the independence of him, and the department makes a decision it needs money, is the trustee going to yield to that demand at that time? Those are concerns I have. But back to where I started, we should come up with the forms acceptable and then let the applicant go through the necessity of proving what they have. No, I think that's a good point. And, and I guess as, as part of that, uh, there's nothing in the rule right now that would preclude somebody from, from using any combination of cash you know, negotiable bonds or securities are, are an irrevocable letter of credit. So certainly is allowed as it stands. Yes, there's nothing for it. I just wanted to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, go back and, and clarify from my mind what you said, Dr. Easler, regarding an irrevocable letter of credit. An irrevocable letter of credit, as I understand it, and you business folks on the board may know better, but is the financial ability of the entity, not the bank. So if I have an irrevocable letter of credit from a bank, the bank is saying that I have the ability to do that. It goes on my balance sheet as a liability, not on the bank's. So if the bank were to close, that letter of, of uh, credit can simply transfer to another bank. There's no payment in the, in the, in the way of the bank failure. It's the entity who has to fail. 
Well, I, I'm with you. I think until uh, I can make a conclusion thereof, um, if that letter of credit, if the bank, a weak bank, a bank fails, and several banks fail, even though this person was uh, certainly uh, of sufficient means to, 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 for them to put money up in case something bad happens, I'm not sure where the money comes from. The, the money the money in that case would come from the entity who had the letter because they have the financial ability to secure the letter. Well, under normal current circumstances, that might be the case. They just don't carry it on their balance sheet. The letter of credit allows them not to put it on their balance sheet. What happens to the state of Maine when all of a sudden they uh, simply, simply march away? And as I say, and I'll be uh, more than happy to send the hundred and two names of the hundred and twenty eight entities of uh, starting with slender but much greater, multi billion dollars worth of money that came from the Department of Transportation, Federal DOT, to build like a cylindra. You're gonna make this great thing. They're all failing around the country. That's since two thousand thirteen, around the world. And so the question is if you have not just one bank but several several entities that could support in the past, and they can't now, then it falls on the DEP and the BEP and who are somewhere in the state to cover stuff if they simply just walk out the door and drop the key in the dirt. Yeah. Uh, I'm still back in the position where if we provide the mechanism for them to provide the assurity, and the trustee working on behalf of the department and the state makes a decision as to whether that's acceptable or not acceptable. I don't think we as a board have to sit here and discuss potential scenarios that could happen. Yes, everything can happen. But I'm assuming the financial capacity, and some of what the commission is saying, the, the financial capacity of the individual borrowing the money is what the entire thing is based on. If he was having that through the Lehman Bank and the Lehman Bank went under, that does not relieve the liability, but it's sure going to make that individual scurry around to reinstitute the protection needs uh, to continue. So if some, some catastrophic happens, that can happen. But I don't think we can sit here and forecast those things. We can come up with a mechanism of what has to be provided as an assurity, whether we want one form or three. Uh, I really think we should have multiple ones because to come up front with cash could be we also don't want someone developing a mine that's cash flow shot because they took all their cash to finance the project on the front end when they could have cash to operate with and have some kind of an assurity behind them that protects them. And that's where we have to be very particular on who and how we set up this trust because that's where the financial knowledge is going to come in. It's not going to be technical, it's going to be financial. I really think we, we don't, we shouldn't have to debate the downsides of each one of these. There's a couple of them I think we probably can throw out, self-bonding and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but right. when we come to these, if we give them the option, then it's their responsibility to prove to us they have the financial ability and back into accomplishment. And if they do, we accept them. And if they don't, we tell them to go somewhere else and try again. I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, well, some of us may, but I don't really, because you give them this form, which says, okay, folks, you may actually have uh, additional ways of doing this, but you're going to have to cover the, uh, you have to give assurance that if something drastic occurs, you can no longer continue to function, that you will have the money to clean the place up, shut it down, clean it up, and meet all our requirements. That's what we're going to say, I assume. And if that's what we're going to say, then uh, you're right. You don't have to do the planning for them. That's up to them anyway. And if you like their offer and say, yeah, we'll be able to do this, or, that's fine. But And then, then the state is taking a risk, a rather substantial risk. Not that they haven't done a substantial risk in other items, but let's face it. They, they plan, you know, I promise I will pay you all this stuff if we decide to close up. And they don't close up, and they become a very profitable and productive mine, and very uh, ecologically oriented, etc. That'll be wonderful. I'd love to see that. And I just wanted to bring that out as something for us to think about. I don't know what the ramifications are 
if all, you know, after the first or second or third year, it shuts down. I don't know. Jim, there's a question to the right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as I keep looking at the letterhead, this is Bureau, Bureau of Environmental Protection. I suspect this is an important time we need to kind of uh, talk with folks you know, about the state, like the Bureau of Finance, Bureau of Economic Development, get some information from folks that do that for a living. When I listen to uh, Representative Chapman, who I don't know, he talked about the Callahan mine and the 24 million, 40 million. Uh, what we're really discussing right now is the disaster that we're stuck with, that we hope we're not ever going to see. Uh, some of the comments here on, on uh, high public acceptance. If you need something that's highly acceptable by the, by the citizens of Maine uh, to protect Maine's image. The Callahan Mine is an example that kind of stays in my mind. Uh, you, know, you can talk about collateralized assets, but I don't really believe that, I certainly do not want to, that can come up with a solution on what the financial remedy is of this. I think you need to look outside of this room folks in the state to get those answers and make a big, bring a recommendation to you. I did, I did work with the contact at the Attorney General's office to uh, review this. It does, does a lot of financial assurance work. In fact, uh, they did suggest some changes to bankruptcy protection and we did incorporate those within here. Uh, the only comment I have, just playing off Jim, was that uh, I would like to see it to say there should be at least uh, two or two or more methods of uh, assurity, so that if one of them goes, it, it'd be kind of far. I would hope unbelievable that two um, two of them went down at the same time. At least we'd have half the money in the short term if, if uh, a bank went under or or a bond company went under. It just required you know at least two forms. One more, one more question I okay. have, too, that and, and doesn't relate to what he was just saying, so it's a little different idea. But one thing you suggested is that the financial capacity of the individual has to be totally open to public scrutiny. Aren't there some rules and regulations that protect them from having to disclose? They have to disclose enough to satisfy the department. Yes. But not a public disclosure so that all their competitors and everybody else will know every penny they have because uh, there has to be some limits to that. No, that, that's a good point. No, I wasn't, didn't mean to suggest that uh, confidential business information would be would be available to the public, simply that the applicant's analysis for the costs of remediating the site, in other words, materials that were developed pursuant to this rule, would in fact be to, to public review during the public participation process. Thanks. Limited experience with the solid waste, mostly the solid waste folks, the DEP and, and, and letters of credit, is that the um, they are set up for DEP. It, yes, it, the letters of credit are set up between the company, let's say in this case the mining company and the bank. Absolutely, but it, the beneficiary is DEP, and it's set up to be very black and white, so that the commissioner can sign what I believe is called a site draft. And the site draft is typically a form that's actually usually, uh, in addition to well, in addition to getting the uh, the uh, letter of credit approved by DEP ahead of time, you also have to get a standby trust agreement with the bank that the mining company would get approved. And usually, it's an attachment. That standby trust agreement is a one-page fill-in-the-blank site draft form, uh, which basically says from the commissioner to the bank and it's given the letter of credit. We, I, I, the commissioner, have decided that we need this money, period. It's that black and white. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying letters of credit are wonderful in all circumstances, but it is very black and white, and I understand from the same uh, attorney that Jeff has talked with in my office that generally speaking, letters of credit are considered much, much better. Thanks, thanks than, for stopping in, Mary. Time. I, I actually had prepared copies of, a, of an example that the department currently has and was going to bring them to you. I don't have them with me, but I will make sure Cindy forwards them to you.
oftentimes a second bag, it doesn't have to be. But that is totally, that is set up by, would be set up by the mining, as I understand, by the mining company. DEP would certainly have to approve the trustee. But in terms of DEP approving the financial assurance, the statute requires DEP up front in a mining application to approve the financial assurance. So the trustee would have nothing of the standby trustee or, or the trustee of, of the cash, of the cash or whatever else would have nothing to do with that. DEP would hire someone or use its own staff, probably hire someone uh, to assist it. But really, it's a statutory obligation for DEP to approve the trust and, um, I mean, to approve financial assurance. And I also want to point out generally that, as Jeff knows, the statute actually does list a number of different kinds of financial assurance instruments, including, you know, surety bond, escrow, cash, CDs, trusts, irrevocable letters of credit. And as long as the department approves the financial assurance, and it actually um, gives some guidance to the department when determining the appropriate security to require, the department shall take into consideration the type and location of the mining operation and the type of security that is adequate to protect the state's financial interest. It's been a while since I've looked at the rules, but I assume that's similar language. So that means on one particular mining application, um, DEP might say that a letter of credit is fine. There might be some other mining application where because of the high risk associated with it, perhaps a letter of credit would not be. Or, might not be acceptable, yeah. or they might require 50-50 or something like that. Or for example, so the, way, the, way, the way the rule is set up for a group C waste only, you could use a surety bond or, or any other acceptable form that we review and okay, whereas once you get to group A or B where there is a higher potential risk, then you're looking at cash, negotiable bonds, or the letter of credit there. Again, all feeding into a trust fund. And in terms, I mean, I, I, I actually think, and Jeff and I have discussed this, the biggest issue with irrevocable letters of credit is that they're irrevocable for one year. <laughs> you can't really get them for more than one year. It, it does put a lot of burden on staff because the bank, if it decides they're usually automatically renewable unless the bank decides to terminate them. Banks have terminated them in the past. Uh, and DEP gets notice of the termination a couple months ahead of time. And the company has a certain amount of time to replace that letter of credit or other financial insurance mechanism. And it does put burden a burden on staff to be on top of their game to make sure that they're getting these notices, letting folks know, and making sure that the company gets replacement financial assurance at all. And if they don't, by a certain time, then the commissioner has to go and grab that money, all before the end of this one year period. To me, that, I mean, that might be a bit more where some of the risk lies, um, just because you can't really, as I understand, you can't really get them for more than, more than one year. But as long as staff is on top of it, should not be a high risk instrument from my understanding of working with, with the um, I don't want to confuse things, but I did get involved with a project with a $10 million letter of credit position for three years. So depending on the financial capability of the group, it may be possible, but it's not the standard for the we went off the street one letter of credit is a one year limit. I know this $10 million project, they got three years, but they had the financial capacity to do it. Yep. Still the same termination, sure. notice, these things of that nature, so you have to step in. And talk. Yep. Uh, depends on the financial capability of who we're talking about. We don't know what that is yet. Yeah, yes. Uh, and, I think the, and, I, and I think the key is to make sure that the rules provide the department enough tools that if, if and when we get an application in here, we can structure that financial assurance and make sure that it, 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 in fact, fully addresses all of our concerns. I think the rule does that. But what's going to be key is down the road when that application comes in. And at that point, that's when third-party people come in, and we need to look at this and make sure that everything is really tight in addressing and, and securing the state's financial interests. This is just the, the outline and the tool to provide us that, that hook, if you will. Is financial. Um, I 
just wanted to look briefly at the insurance requirement and make sure we understand what that is, because a number of persons commenting on the rule um, felt that there should be liability insurance that covers off-site folks um, if there's a bill. My understanding is that the insurance requirement is only sort of operations, for employees at the site, or accidents at the site, but there's not sort of a liability insurance here associated with a breach of containment that may damage somebody else's property. Is, is that correct? That's correct, sir. And how, and I guess this is a question for, uh, for Mary, if a person had a claim like that, they would, I'm assuming, have to pursue it independently. Is that right? Unlike for oil spills, I don't think we have in the mining statute any anything set up for third party damage claims. You know, there is a there is such a program in the event of oil spills where someone can go you know, to the department and get up to you know a couple hundred thousand dollars in damages. But there is nothing like that set up, so it would have to be a private lawsuit. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, and then finally, uh, would like the the third party inspector provisions. I think there were some questions and concerns uh, regarding third party uh, inspectors. And a lot of commenters over the years have said, "Well, we should have third parties reviewing things and so forth." Uh, some of the places, and and we did take the time to identify some of the locations where, in fact, the department does have a third party uh, either inspecting or reviewing or helping us to process applications, uh, one of which right in, right in financial assurance and insurance requirements in Section 17A7, uh, we have a provision that all terms and conditions of financial assurances must be approved by the departments and must be analyzed by individuals with documented experience in material handling and construction, mining costs, and financial analysis. And then we said if the department does not have adequate in-house expertise, the department shall hire third parties with document experience, and I'll paraphrase it on, on all of those issues, uh, to analyze and evaluate the proposed terms and conditions of financial assurance required by the applicant of the permit E. And the individuals and and or company hired to perform this function shall have no conflict of interest the applicant related persons applicants consultants attorneys or their employees and then these third party costs are in fact borne by the applicant uh, for the mining standards in section 19 h we have a, a subsection independent reviewer the department may retain an independent reviewer to assist in the review of documents, plans, models, designs, studies, analyses, characterizations, applications, amendments, financial assurance mechanisms, field operations, and any other submission. And then finally, in the inspection maintenance section, section 25, the permittee using qualified professionals shall inspect all phases of the mining operation to ensure compliance with the design and construction specifications standard operating procedures, the mining permit, applicable rules, and the act. Nothing in this section limits the ability of the department to conduct inspections in any area of the property or to require corrective actions to address deficiencies identified in the monitoring data or as a result of such inspections. And then going down to the most relevant part, B, each phase of mine construction must be inspected by qualified professionals according to the quality assurance plan approved by the department. For construction of containment structures and impoundments, the qual construction quality assurance must include continuous site inspection by CQA personnel. Inspection, testing, and certification must be done by construction quality assurance personnel separate from the permittee. So there's a third party inspection requirement in the inspection maintenance provisions. And then later on, there are additional uh, third party inspection requirements for all other phases of mine constructions, mine operations, uh, and 
also for, I believe, the closure. Uh, one thing that we have given some thought to is to add an additional uh, condition of approval, uh, and this is after hearing some of the public comment and reading some of the public comments, uh, on as a condition of approval to require the permittee to require an independent third party inspector basically to oversee and they would they would develop a, a third party inspection plan it might cover actual construction and, and operation facility in addition to monitoring of a site you know typical wastewater monitoring or groundwater monitoring and require them to have an on-site ins inspector uh, it might be once a week it might be twice a week uh, conduct inspections uh, throughout the life of the mine. So in addition to having these third-party inspectors, we would also have an additional third-party inspector paid by the applicant uh, that basically kind of oversees and makes sure, makes sure that they're following their mine plan uh, in accordance with, with their permit. And then uh, they would also provide those reports to the department. So. We'll have a person reviewing sites, but we, we would have a third person, or a third party, if you will. And I'm just floating that to the board. It was something you might want us to at least look and provide. How would this look? How would this work? We do, we do a similar process for, uh, I believe, wind power projects. Uh, mostly it's restricted to stormwater controls during the, the operate or the construction of a site. But we do require, as a condition of approval, uh, you know, similar third-party inspectors, but just not as not as comprehensively. Uh, town, of, oops, town of Farmington hired a third-party, as you're suggesting, uh, when Walmart came in a number of years ago, particularly for the uh, rainwater system. And uh, this fellow was well known. I think he was up in Bangor somewhere. He was well known by the town manager as a person of great uh, intelligence and uh, productivity. And he was, indeed. And he came to the Board of Select Men, or the Planning Board, I can't remember which, on a fairly regular basis to give us an interim report on what was occurring at Walmart on the grounds and what they were doing and, and so on. And. Uh, I don't see any problem whatsoever having something like that that could be even uh, more far-ranging if it was somebody who was actively working in a mine situation for a number of years and doing things like that, had that knowledge. Right. Um, you, you put it basically, although they would hire the person, uh, you, you folks would determine who it would be. You'd basically put a request for a proposal out for somebody to come and apply for for such a job. That's, that's pretty much exactly what, what I was envisioning. We would establish some, some, some background and, and qualification requirements. Uh, yes, the applicant could, could propose somebody to us, but we would, we would have the ability to, to give them the yes or the no. Following up on that, I think one of the things that we'd be interested in getting from the board is um, some further direction on what is, what is the period of time during the operation of the site that you would want the rules to require that the permittee is paying an on-site inspector to report to the department? And what is the frequency that you would want that person to be there? Is it only during construction? Is it during the entire life of the site? What, what are some parameters, you know, if you can provide us with some feedback to, to frame those potential requirements, bearing in mind that this is in addition to then the requirements that are already in the rule that you have outlined before you, which currently do require for the permittee to have an independent third party assisting them in overseeing and inspecting the work during the construction phase. But Ginger earlier, I'll answer that question with a question, I guess. <laughs> Just looking at this, we don't, we don't have, the state does not have experience with a facility such as this. Um, and I'm looking at these, you know, the rules and the regulations and the requirements therein. 
and my, my first question is, you know, if we did, what type of, what, what staff demands is that going to have on, on the department staff? Um, you know, because we just talked about the potential for making sure letters of credit are, are maintained. I mean, you, you go through monitoring, you go, you know, and, and all of it. So, in a sense, what I'm envisioning is, you know, a, a, a DEP staff person who's paid for by the mine operator. How that actually, whether that person's actually an employee of the state or is, is a consultant, those types of details, I guess, can be worked out. But in my mind, I'm thinking you just all of the above through construction. And, and what strikes me with the, what we have already in the rules is you may have different people, in this case, doing different parts. But it almost seems like you need someone that's overseeing all of that, making sure everyone's kind of doing their part. Um, and in my mind, if if, if, a, if a mine operator wants to take on a project like this, that seems like it would be a small piece of the pie to, to that would yield a lot of, um, perhaps or maybe not a lot of, more public confidence that everything is being done as it is intended to be. It would seem to me that the biggest liabilities are during operation and that that's when you would have someone touring the site looking at those areas where you have the biggest liability um, you know during construction I guess I mean that that's you need somebody who understands uh, building construction, mine, mine development, stuff like that, and real specialty, I would assume. But when it comes to containment structures, uh, anything that could fail and cause you environmental problems, that's when you would best have somebody on site inspecting the facilities now how often do you do that i i don't know um, if they're a reliable company uh, you may not have to do it very often but if they're show signs of cutting short cutting stuff then you may have to have somebody there on a weekly basis just to make sure that things are functioning at a at a point where where you feel comfortable where they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, and, and you need somebody who understands, I, I guess, uh, the facilities that are going to cause you the most difficulty because <clears throat> I've had some experience with folks from the DEP coming into a site that have no idea what they're looking at and making comments and suggestions and say, why, why are you doing that? That makes no sense. So. Um, you know, it would seem to me that having somebody with some experience, and maybe it's on staff, maybe it's not on staff. I mean, I, I, that's something you have to figure <coughs> out. But that's the kind of inspections that I would see would be most beneficial. If you look at way over for us, it talks about the Construction must be inspected by qualified professionals <coughs> with a quality assurance plan. That's in B, and that plan has to be approved by the department. And then you go down to B1, and basically what it says that anybody who has a contractual relationship with the owner operator and has a similar contractual relationship with somebody else, so they could be one inspectors, doesn't say a thing about they have to be related to the mining, but it can be employed. Uh, by the owner operator, commissioned by the owner operator, but it doesn't say they have to be approved by the department for that position. And I think that's a real loose spot. So I paraphrase a little bit, but if you read it, it says, for purposes of the section separate from the permittee means the CQA personnel are not direct employees of the permittee. That's fine. Direct employment of the owner operator 
does not include CQA personnel employed by a company under contractual relationship with the owner operator. That's fine. Provided that the CQA personnel are employed by a company that offers and performs quality assurance services for other companies not affiliated with the owner operator. It doesn't say if you're even experienced in mining, it says they just have to not be affiliated. They could be uh, stormwater pond, retention pond operators. We have to somehow tie that down. The second thing in there that's totally missing is whoever the company uses. This doesn't, the way this is what it doesn't provide for department acceptance of those individuals. And that's really critical, I think. And just to clarify, Chairman, are you envisioning those requirements to clarify qualifications for the CQA personnel and the approval by the department as a separate matter from the conversation about, in addition to those CQA personnel having the permittee retain a long-term on-site inspector that is reporting directly to the department, or are you saying? Well, that, that but also there's one more little thing in there too, that you missed, is I want those CQA people to have experience in mining and demonstrate that they have experience in mining, presumably with other companies, because if not, basically you've left this wide open that anybody who has a contractual relationship with somebody other than this individual doing you know, CQA inspections could do a CQA inspection list. They may not have the experience. So I want that okay. mining relevance in there. So we'll that's what we're critical. And, and I think one of the guys here just said probably it's going to be hard to find it in Maine since we don't have many mines. Uh, but there are people out there within this country and other places who probably do have a great deal of experience. Then we've got to be careful. Well, this is what it is. It's potential for that individual to come up with a, a QCA plan that's a little bit different than what the department wants. So the department's going to be involved in the approved process so that they don't go do it the way they do it and not have the department oversee how the department wants the information provided. Okay? I just wanted to speak to that a little bit because we do have requirements for department approval of inspectors associated with these structures that we're talking about. And we also have another section in the rules, and I just want to point out because if we need to change something up. Well, I did look at that with you on, uh, well, it's my page 25, so I don't know what page on the board packet it is. Uh, there's a section underneath the engineering report that talks about quality assurance plan and its application submittal. And as part of that submittal, they have to lay out all of the qualifications of the personnel involved in inspecting uh, the different aspects of the mine site with regards to the construction side. That's what I'm speaking to right now. And that has to come in for approval, and we have to understand the relationships of the CQA personnel, what their qualifications and experience are to do that kind of work. So that that is in the application requirements, and then we carry that through into construction. Well, that, that's not what we were given here, that's 200. And, and what you're saying that takes care of the construction, but it doesn't really come out and stress the mining operation. Under the chapter 200, the one that Jeff just gave us, the wording that's on the back of this sheet, I think is very inadequate. So if you have something that gives, that resolves the issue I just raised, when you get your data back, just give it to us so we know. Because the intent is to have, and I think out there, I don't want to put it way down, but I think there's some people out in the public who probably don't trust the DEP staff for being either qualified or non-prejudiced, which I think is wrong. However, uh, if we have to provide somebody out there to, to give the citizens that confidence, we should do it. We should make sure that they're experienced in mining, not something else. And that's really critical. No, I, we'll, we'll prepare some, some language for you for Section 25 to make sure that's in there. Like the 
several last presentations on that end of the table and halfway up the this side. I think they're all well stated. I keep wondering about uh, different ways of looking at this. Uh, for a good portion, whoever a person or the persons involved in this would more likely than not be some type of engineers. They would have had some engineering background. As I know, the fellow who worked at Walmart engineered the, uh, the um, what do you call it, the pond that you, it's named that we build a pond to, to, to delay the flow of water into the river. Retention. Retention. retention, thank you, retention pond. I need a retention in my brain somewhere. Um, and he, so he was an, it's not just guy off the street, he was an engineer and uh, probably retired and had done some of that stuff. Same time, the younger group coming on, more often or not, are getting courses, either online or in person, to sort of like you walk into the kitchen car fixed and all over the wall. They have the name of all of the mechanics in the garage who passed a certain thing in mufflers and on the engine and repair and that kind of stuff. Um, so the question is, it'd be really nice, I would assume, that if if you had the wherewithal to do it, you'd have a group of five or six people who work together as a staff, and, and that would not be the full-time job. That just would be a part-time thing where they did their, their work. But where do they come from? Do they come from the DEP, or do they come from, um, from out on the street somewhere, or maybe some retired engineers? I don't know. I just think it's a wonderful idea to have um, a mixture of, of expertise at one level or not to deal with watching to make sure that the permittee is actually doing what they are supposed to be doing. And therein is where I, I agree 100% uh, with the chairman that, you know, we're looking, we, we need to have somebody who has uh, some mining experience. Now you can get experience among different number of different ways, and I, the way edu education is going these days, somebody who's pretty bright to start with could probably get themselves a really good understanding by taking some some um, some lessons from the various aspects. I don't know. I don't know where, why, but I like the idea. One more thing that I'm bringing into the Oh, that's all right. No problem. I just want a clarification. You were asking um, if we, because these are already in here, some of the rules, and it says very clearly it'll be a, a third party person um, qualified. I'd like a definition of qualified. I think that's a really good thing to find out what qualified is. And then um, you were asking that during construction, there's going to be someone that's going to be inspecting and then reporting back in, third party. And then further on, you say um, after that, during the post. Um, during the operation and reclamation period, um, there must be a qualified person again that's inspecting on a regular basis. That's in here. You're asking for somebody in addition to that, besides that, is that what I'm hearing? To clarify the question, I'm asking if the board in response to the comments that you received during the testimony and the comments believes that we should add a requirement. Okay, that. so you have automatically in there that's qualified that's looking at construction a person that inspects it on a regular basis again that's qualified and in addition they would hire um, another person that would report back to you on a regular basis on what's going to make sure for the miners sake the mining company's sake as well as yours that everything is being followed so you're talking about another um, consultant or person because that is a concept that was proposed at the public hearing. So we wanted to follow up with the board and find out your interest as to whether or not we should add that in above and beyond the provisions that are already in the rule. Right. On that one, I, I just want to put my, if, you, if we agree to do that, I think it's somebody that both the company and the DEP would agree to. You know, not just that the, that the um, DEP would be overseeing, because I think in all fairness, it's for their sake as well as yours. They don't want to have to pay up for any mistakes, and you don't want to have to have them pay up for any mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that additional position I want to go on the call is I think you'll 
help develop some confidence in the people outside and looking in. But the way this is worded, I think, is even better in some ways, even though the one I just mentioned is missing. He talks about a company having a contactual relation. Now, is that QC, uh, CQ? You know, a guy might be doing a fantastic job and have a heart attack. There's nobody to back him up. This does give some backup to that. We want the continuity. Again, I think the additional, I think the additional think it's expense to the developer and support for the department, I think, will help build us a little more confidence. That's one thing I heard at the public hearing that was quite important to some people. I, I, I would like to ask the board if anyone had any other issues uh, if you'd like to bring up. Yes. Mark answer that one. He, he seems to know the answer. I don't. I don't either. That's why I asked I think you have to go back and look at the framework of law where it says that if you don't have financial assurance, the commission can immediately terminate the license. Uh, let me just find that in the uh, in the framework law. I just looked at it a second ago and I probably put my hand back on it. It does. Um, Actually, the, the statute says failure to provide financial assurance. This says failure to maintain. Basically, it just says failure to provide financial assurance. This is the statute I'm reading for. Sure. Under this section constitutes grounds for the department to order immediate suspension of mining activities. And I believe. The language that you see on page 57, section 18, is similar, but I think it all comes right out of the statute. So it only deals with financial insurance, not insurance. So I guess one question would be is to look at whether there's authority to insurance there or whether, as a policy matter, it makes sense. Because right now, it, looks, it just looks a little funny to see, it just, especially because it comes right after you know, a paragraph on insurance. So it just kind of pops out of the Anyway, something to think about. We'll put it on the previous page. <laughs> Based on the long discussion that we just uh, finished a few moments ago, it seemed to me that the DEP commissioner might want to be thinking seriously about meeting with your excellent staff and seeing if you can come up with a solution to the company, if you will, that's going to take over what we want them to do to make sure that the, the operation is going properly. And it, I suspect that once we get an applicant and then subsequently a permittee, um, the DEP is going to be very darn busy, more so than they already are with the zillions of things that they get done. But it might be worthwhile doing some internal brainstorming to think how you might suggest uh, that a group be put together to, to do what we've been talking about. Anyway, just thought I'd start it up. Any further comments? Questions? Okay, 
Okay, um, my understanding is that for the board's next regular meeting on November 3rd, staff is going to um, bring back the rule that went out to public hearing with changes uh, based upon discussion this morning, if you language, and that will go out to you well in advance of the meeting so that members will have a chance to study the language changes that we talked about today. And, and at that meeting on November 3rd, um, go walk through those with staff, and if you're comfortable with those, um, get your approval to put those out for public comment. And if you need a little more time than that, it would be a, another meeting on the following week on November 10th. So um, I've spoken with Melanie briefly, and she thinks that they can turn some language around in a couple of weeks' time um, with adequate time for you to review it prior to the November 3rd meeting. And I'll note there may be some uh, additional changes in there. For example, staff has been looking at cleaning up some cross-references and things like that that were a little ambiguous in the rule that went out to hearing. And so uh, they would try to pull all of that together in a document that you could review prior to November 3rd. Nothing else before the board. First of all, thank you for your presentation, your time today.